This is the Far East Empress, Maja One, and my hip hop is brave, royal, revolutionary, feminine, gangster, and always independent. Merdeka Taumati, Ja! This is Radio Freedom. If you don't stand up for something, you'll fall for anything. Come on! Listen, listen! listen. Planet Earth, Planet Rap. The only segment show and station in the hip hop world playing the hip hop world. In the hip hop world playing the hip hop world. With me going on kill one. Hello and welcome to PEPR, Planet Earth, Planet Rap Virtual World Tour Series, where we get an opportunity to speak to various artists, hip hop artists from around the hip hop world. My name is Amkelwa. Yes, my name is Miko. It's it's really it's really a pleasure to have this conversation. To be honest with you, you know we are not quite all the way to the end of the series recording these things. I mean, uh, but it's uh, really an uplifting thing to do this uh, to be able to talk to some of these great artists whose music we've been playing for ten years, maybe eleven years. Uh, you know, uh, and 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 now we get a chance to have a little bit more meaningful conversations with them than than perhaps before. Yes, it's interesting because we have a history of playing the work, but. Of Of course, we never got the opportunity, not with most of them. Sometimes we've had opportunities to speak to some artists, but this time we get to even target many more so that we can get some insight into who the artists themselves are. So it is quite insightful. It's quite great. Yeah, and it is really nice also because, to be honest with you, uh, to be able to, to for, for us to have to... <laughs> Not have to. I mean, it would be amazing to be able to travel and see all these different people in their places. But it would be. It's it's a little bit unrealistic uh, in, in, in 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 many times. And and this has been a great opportunity to to record some of these uh, interviews. Uh, you know, on uh, from distance. And this is a part. Of, uh, this is a part of Rapstation. Uh, com Productions. And uh, you can also see all the uh, vi- visuals from uh, the application RSTV app. Yes, yes. And our next guest is Major One from Singapore. We had a fantastic conversation talking to her. Yes? Yes, well, a big energy. She's got a big, huge energy and and, and, and and in her music and also in person when we talked to her. Yeah, like it was, uh, I was re-energized. <laughs> totally. <laughs> so thank you for joining us and we hope you enjoy the conversations as much as we did. P-E-P-R You know, it's Pretty amazing, actually. Um, for us, we just celebrated the Lunar New Year out here in Southeast Asia. It's the year of the water tiger, so it's time of transformation and metamorphosis, and that's definitely what's happening. I'm seeing a lot of elevation happening around me and for me, so positive things. Then. Yes, yes. And, and, and tell us, uh, during this lockdown period, I think most artists have been suffering greatly because their livelihood was kind of put on hold and they've been experiencing a lot of challenges in not being able to perform. How have you navigated this time? Have you been creative? What have you done with your time during the lockdown and during the pandemic? Well, gosh, when it first happened, you know, I was I'm from Singapore, but I was in Malaysia when it happened. So I was kind of locked down on this side of the border with less resources and that kind of thing. But I kind of reminded myself that when, you know, when I was a kid and when we're growing up and we're like angsty teenagers, music was kind of what I had to be my therapy and be the thing to get me through the worst times. And I feel like it's a real blessing when we can be creative and and write and and create this music and create something from nothing. So I I put out an EP called Freedom Fades. Freedom Fades. Expressed, it, mm. For me, it expressed what I was feeling about this entire time. I think I caught like an MIA like live stream on IG where she said, you know, this generation that is being born now might be born into a generation where their definition of freedom is very different from our definition of freedom. So it could be as simple as, you know, going to a music festival without a mask on, yes, you know, and to yes. them it will be normal because you're born into that generation. But for us, yeah, that freedom fades because we knew something else. And so I really contemplated this thought of like, you know, is it freedom if we didn't really know and we're born into the time and, you know, all the perspectives of that. And I just started writing, I worked with my longtime collaborator, this uh, DJ Alex, who is originally from Lisbon, um, but what, give me one, sorry, uh, from Lisbon, but he is now 
uh, in Singapore. And we just put together an EP. We put it out as a music mask. Uh, it's because, you know, the mask thing started yeah. coming true. So I said, well, you know, I'm going to go with that flow and uh, create a mask where you could just scan the mask for the music and it takes you straight to the platform to listen to the music. And we donated partial proceeds to um, a mental health awareness organization in Singapore called the Samaritans of Singapore, uh, help with suicide prevention and mental health awareness. And I just felt like this time the the topic of mental health would really come into question, you know, when we start having to be more inside and face losses and this type of thing. So that was my initial response to it. Um, and for the business, I run a record label called New Santara Records. And I've been very blessed early on to find placements for music, whether in Netflix or movies or TV. So we decided to pivot the whole record company to be more of a publishing company and help different artists place their music into you know different sync and licensing opportunities. Because if you can't perform out in the bar, then more people are watching Netflix now than ever, probably. You know. Yes, so, <laughs> captive right. audience. So we have a captive audience. Yeah, so we wanted to start giving these artists the opportunity to place their music into these movies and, and television shows so that they could still earn an income throughout this time. So those were kind of my two big pivots during this time. You were, you were, you were on some, you had your music somewhere on Netflix. I, do I remember correctly or, or am, I, am I mistaken? Yeah, I mean, I've been really, really lucky for a lot of uh, placements throughout my career. Um, most recently, it was like Snowpiercer, Altered Carbon. Uh, what else do we do? Wu Assassins was a big one. Um, and the a large one for me was uh, Fast and Furious 8. They took my song Warrior's Tongue and placed it in the trailer. So that's that's pretty crazy for me as an independent artist uh, to to get placements in in, in those places. Just just please tell us a little bit more about that particular experience, because I think a lot of people would like to know what exactly happened with that Fast and Furious. It's a nice anecdote. <laughs> and, and it's a great story in its own way. Oh, we're going to get into this. Um, <laughs> basically, you know, there was, there was a producer that came to me and said that, you know, I, I just want this placement for a song in my little independent record. And after negotiating, we're like, yeah, you know, it's just going to be an independent record. And... Um, he was just telling me he's going to use a very small sound bite just because it's a very catchy sound like with the little guns come mana wanna boss guns so he's like oh it's just just a little ear candy but he didn't want me as a featured artist on the song he said like well it's just like you know uh, sampling aretha franklin she's mm -hmm. a part of the beat but she's not a feature we're not saying featuring aretha franklin so at the time I had just moved to Singapore from being away for most of my life. I grew up in Canada. I was working in America. I just moved back from Jamaica. So I was like, you know, this is an opportunity. I was feeling appreciated. Like, oh, you like my song? Nice, you know. And I really should have consulted a lawyer. So for all the artists out there and creatives that are listening to this right now, from my heart, you know, it, it's money to spend that might save the next eight years of your life. So seriously consult a lawyer when you're signing anything and um yes yeah, so he placed in his independent record and a couple years later a friend was walking in new york's times square and they're like i swear to god i hear your voice playing out of every speaker in times square right now and i was like there's no way like you you tripping you racist you think every asian sound the same <laughs> you know like there's no way it's me and he's like no seriously there's no one that sounds like you this is definitely you and he showed me like a video and at those times smartphones like the video was not great but yeah i definitely heard my song you know a sped up version of my song but it was my song i was like what's going on like are you serious like how am i being played in times square right now and so when i started to look into it i realized that uh, fast and furious 8 had closed down all the speakers in Times Square for it to debut the trailer of this like sixth biggest movie franchise in the world. And that my song had in fact been sampled as the main trailer song and my voice was like most of that trailer. And so when I went back to his record company, I found out like, yeah, yeah, you know, we, we did this remix and it got placed in Fast and Furious. And I'm like, nice, you know, like, so I'm gonna see like, um, first some credit and also some some money to sustain and create out, out of it. But I realized quickly that I had signed a bad deal mm -hmm. 
Mm. Um, I wasn't credited immediately in the featured credits. If you look into the little liner notes, it's somewhere in there, Meja One, Warrior's Tongue. Um, and also that, you know, there was nothing I could do about it because I had signed a deal that had said if there were remakes of the song, he could exploit my voice and, and the sample any way that he had he wished. So did, even though I had agreed you hadn't to it, realized it at the time when you were signing it. Mm. It, it wasn't a fine print, um, mm -hmm. you know, straight up, I signed a bad deal, but it was in bad faith because when I had spoken to the producer, he really had said like, yo, it's just a little sample. We're hardly going to, you know, it's just going to be part of the beat. And it turned out to be like the main the vocal main for, mm -hmm. for this trailer of a major movie. So I would just say like, you know, two things, artists, watch your backs because, you know, you might be feeling low and down and like take any deal that you but really just consult a professional. It's so, so important. And also for creators out there, if you're in a position to help out like independent artists or to do that placement, be fair, you know, like give people their due credits. I had just moved to Singapore at the time. So I was kind of building up my career from the ground up all over again. And it would have really helped <laughs> to yes. have a credit on that song. We put it out to media, but no one really believed that it was me because oh my, my name wasn't front and center on that song so like no but why why don't we see your name on this thing and like <laughs> just look look it's in the little liner notes but oh media don't care about that media wants that flash and it's it's yes. right there you know so i would just encourage anyone that's in a position to uh, elevate different artists and give them that platform like give them that platform those collaborations are so beautiful and it's great to credit people and um, and especially you know in this game in a very male dominated space it's great to credit female artists when they get to certain places you know um so yeah that that's kind of my my really hard earned learned lesson with from yeah, that yeah. and since that day i've been really helping out a lot of independent artists look over contracts and not make the same mistake that i did yeah i was gonna say that sorry i was actually gonna say that there must have been some good that came out of that rather bad experience and what 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 did what did how did that impact you and what work you do after that happened to you I mean, I did get to connect with a lot of um, other producers when I found out that this producer had done the same to other female creatives that he had worked with. So connecting with them, realizing that, wait a minute, I'm not the only person that this happened to. And I think that, you know, I spent a long time in this hip hop game, like uh, definitely around a lot of guys being like one of the guys and that kind of thing. And, you know, when I first started, a lot of media asked me, what's it like being an Asian female MC? Because at the time, I, my up was in Canada and there wasn't really that many people that looked like me or or spit or wrote from my perspective um, so I always kind of denied that I'm like no nah, I'm not a female MC I'm just an MC respect that you know yes <laughs> but when these things happen I realize that I do represent something it matters that you are a female Asian MC because yes. that representation it mm. represents a voice, it represents a perspective. Um, and so realizing these things and realizing for for so long, I kind of just wanted to be, be down, you know, like I'm cool, I'm one of the guys, this and that. And really uh, these type of experience showed me like, no, it's very valuable that I speak out about these things. It's very valuable that I share my experiences so that someone that, you know, is in the same kind of, um, path as me doesn't make the same mistakes yes. and I think that I'm in a position now having been in the industry for this long to open doorways for a lot of other um, female MCs Asian MCs whatever like you know any any voices that are not as represented in the space I mean because at the end of the day that is hip-hop you know yes. uh, to represent the different vo voices that are not usually heard so yeah Definitely a learning curve. And I got real good at reading contracts, I'll tell you that much. <laughs> you got a, a, Never gonna make the same mistake again. You got extra magnifying glass for the for the fine print. The um we we when when we do PPR and we are playing music from around the world, one of the things that we always do in the liner no or like in the notes show notes, we are kind of like 
and then in brackets putting like all the countries like the country where the person artist is from and and we, in your case we kind of like have to go to the next next row next line because there's so many <laughs> different places you've already mentioned a couple of them you've talked about Canada you've mentioned uh, Jamaica and, and 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 Malaysia and and, and Singapore. Singapore I mean you know it's a long list like what, what's this about like tell us a little bit about like your your journey in the most geographical sense of the word also not just in a you know in all the other ways but 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 you know what's your life story well first of all i gotta say thank you to pepr for like actually representing that you know most people be like ah just pick one let's just put you in there you know uh, i was born in singapore i discovered hip-hop when i was eight years old i was in a market like a wet market and i saw a bootleg cassette tape a uh, two two bootleg cassette tapes in the store. Uh, one was Bananarama, the other was Public Enemy. And I bought them with my Lunar New Year money. I was like, I had a little Ang Pao money, you know, you get those red packets uh, during this time of year. And I spent my cash on that and I put them both in. And needless to say, I really loved the, the Public Enemy <laughs> cassette tape that I got. I bumped it 24-7. Uh, all my cousins were listening to, you know, Taiwanese and Japanese pop music at the time. And here I was like, fight the power. Oh, oh. <laughs> and they're like, what is wrong with this little girl, you know? What resonated um, with you there? Sorry, what was it that resonated with you as an eight-year-old? I think when I first heard the music, well, first, I what resonated for me to pick up the cover was Flavor Flav on the cover, because you're a kid. So he looked like a cartoon character to yes. me with a clock. I'm like, woo, this is for kids, you know? <laughs> so I pick, that's why I picked up the cassette tape. And when I listened to it, like, at, at that age and also where I was living, I didn't necessarily understand the political in, you know, intonations of what was being said. But I just always said, like, I feel like something really urgent and something really important is being said here, you know? And so little by little, anything that, you know, Chuck D said in his lyrics, I look it up, you know, like, okay, what's blood in my eye? Okay, who's Iceberg Slim? Okay, what is this? And I was reading these books when I was like nine, eight years old, nine years old, not really understanding what I was reading, but slowly, slowly as I grew and I re reread the books, I'm like, oh man, like, you know, this is injustice. This is what happens. Um, this is people speaking out. This is using art to speak out. And I mean, I mean, just think about the song Fight the Power itself. Like in Asia, we are ta taught to just obey the power. You know, that yeah. would be the remix song out here. <laughs> <laughs> And so at a very young age, I was taught that, you know, just because you're told something doesn't mean it's right. You know, and to have your own soul and your own understanding and your own opinion about things. And I think it was really a blessing that hip hop music and that music taught me that valuable lesson at such a young age. Wow. Um, Absolutely. So when I moved to Canada, yeah, and when I moved to Canada, I'm like, okay, I think the mecca of, of hip hop is in New York. So I'm one step closer to New York. And so when I moved to Canada, we immigrated when I was eight years old. I grew up in Canada and I would just search anything that had to do with hip hop because suddenly it was a treasure trove where it was really hard to find anything hip hop in Southeast Asia at the time. Now I was in Canada. I bought a Tribe Called Quest tape. I got my first Dela. I got my like native tongues all day. Um, and I just fell in love with everything. Um, you know, I started out as a graph writer. I, I wrote Blue City and eventually Mesha One. Um, I be, I dabbled in b-girling, but I was like, no, nah, that's not for me. Too many bruises. This hurts. <laughs> <laughs> Too lazy for that. Um, <laughs> and then I eventually went to the University of Toronto for architecture. And while I was there, I started hitting open mics. Mm -hmm. And my roommate that moved in, this man named Jesse Otaki, who became my first manager, uh, shouts out to Jesse Otaki. Um, he he was heavily into hip hop. He was running events. And one day he had an event for an all female showcase. Someone dropped out. So I was real shy at the time. I was like, oh, I kind of rap. Like, I, I love to do that. You know, can I, can I just try? And I just want to prove to myself one time that I could just do it that one time. And from that one show, um, I got um, a commercial on Much Music, which is like Canadian MTV. And it just went, it went from there, it just kept going and it kept going. And, you know, a producer named Che Vicious saw my videos, uh, Return of the B-Girl on television, on, on Much Music, 
called me to Arizona and LA to dem- demo some stuff for him. He was working with Dr. Dre at the time. He was working with basically all my hip hop heroes. Yeah. And I went out to LA and, and I started ghostwriting and, and working on a record with him. And uh, yeah, got to collaborate with, uh, you couldn't even imagine a kid that was eight years old from Singapore, got to collaborate with the RZA, got to collaborate with Talib Kweli, got to collaborate with Pharrell Williams. Like it's, it's, it's really crazy. A dream come true. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I still pinch myself today, you know, because uh, at the time I went from being a fan and still a fan yeah. to almost being a contemporary, like being in the studio and be like, Major, what do you think? I'm like, you asking me what I think? All right, <laughs> let me throw this down right now. <laughs> let me tell you what I think. <laughs> so it, it's a beautiful experience, you know, and, and it would have never happened if I didn't take a chance either yeah. on that cassette tape that I found or take a chance on, you know, getting up on that stage when I was nervous and shy or take a chance when Che called me and I was like, you're lying. You don't work for Dre. All right, let me check this out. <laughs> you know, um, so definitely. And a few years in Hollywood, I felt a little out of place. I wanted to reconnect with my spirit. And when I was a kid, my brother used to play Peter Tosh and Bob Marley and Toots and the Maytals and a lot of reggae music. And I was like, cool Herc, right? Like that's, that's kind of like a, a start of hip hop too. Yes. So I'm like, let me go to Jamaica and check the thing out. <laughs> go back to the roots. <laughs> Let's go to the root roots, you know, and I wanted to get back to my roots because I had mm. spent years in L.A. Uh, ghostwriting and writing a lot of pop music that, that, you know, like it was fun. It was really great to learn a really good hook and learn structures of songs and learn, you know, wh- why a song becomes ear candy. But I wanted to get back to what I really loved, which was like the heart and soul of the music. So I moved to Jamaica. I ended up there for five years. <laughs> Got to work out at projects out of Tough Gong Studios um, and see Bob Marley's handwriting on the piano and everything. <laughs> and then eventually I moved back to Singapore and I uh, had to relearn my own culture all over again. And so now I'm back in Southeast Asia. I'm currently in Malaysia, next door to Singapore. And that's where we at. <laughs> right around the world. Planet hip hop, right? <laughs> planet wow. around, planet around. <laughs> yes, that is exactly. That is exactly. That is a really remarkable story, and there's so much. There's so much there to really uh, uh, unpack if you want to. If you want to get into that, but how, tell me a little bit about like how 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 was the experience then? Because I know, and there was so much that I can also relate to, even though I'm coming from a very con- diff- com- entirely different context. But uh, but for coming from like hip hop, then how did you like? How did you feel about the pop music? You started writing even even pop songs. How, uh, was that something that you know was like? Oh, you know, it's it's, a, it's like a side hustle, or or or, or 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 how did you feel about that change? Well, I think it's you know it's always good to learn and grow in life, you know. And I can't listen to my lyrical prowess, you know, sixteen bars all day kind of scene to seeing like you know like as a song can you write that hook um, working in music studios where I thought I you know, become all along like all right those two lines are good I'm like what these two lines but then I would watch them you know piece together two of the best lines from this writer and two of the best lines from that writer and two of my best lines and it was going in to the era where you know songs were almost structured as hook one hook two hook three like the whole song was a hook to kind of be that ear candy um so i think it was valuable to learn those lessons and also then valuable to learn what i want for my own music maybe it's not necessarily that um and something really valuable also was i used to believe that you know you need to be divine inspired before you can sit down and write and then you know John will come and descend upon you and you'll write your brilliance, which is still true. But something I learned from uh, Martha, uh, Marsha Ambrosia uh, in Flowetry, uh, was that, you know, writing music is muscle memory. So just like an athlete would train every day to become fast and your muscle understand how to move fast, so is songwriting. So even on the days you don't feel like sitting down and completing that song, You sit down and write that song anyways, because it might not be your best, but you're really training your mind to be able to always pull from that place and, and, you know, uh, come up with something and create something. And I remember she was saying that she wrote and recorded one song every day. I was like, whoa, you a G. 
your G, like right and record one song a day like that with that type of dedication and consistency and practice you really become a great writer because it's muscle memory at the end of the day so i thought that was something very valuable um to learn and the other thing is you know all the cliches of hollywood the casting couch the hopefuls the kind of um uh, the different, the darker side of the industry, I got to witness the good, the bad, the ugly, you know, so I really got to understand how to set my own boundaries and realize what I want as an artist, um, how I value being an independent artist, because at some point I was offered a very nice record deal and they wanted me to be the Chinese Nicki Minaj. <laughs> and I was like, have you met me? Like, yo, my Chinese mother will beat my ass if I like wear certain things in a video. <laughs> and, and, you know, I was also warned that like, you know, if you're going to go into that life, you could never leave your house without a perfect face of makeup or beautiful sunglasses and just being gorgeous all the time. And, you know, as much as I, I do enjoy in my heart, I'm a ragamuffin man. I like to just roll out in my, you know, pajamas and just check out the street and see what's going on. So I said, I don't know if I'm the right person for that, but I will write for that person. Uh, so that's how I wanted to maintain my freedom as an artist. That's that makes sense. That sounds like a good deal, like in, in a way that you can you can like get see get the experience all of those things. But there's a lot of that, and you talked about freedom in a different kind of way. But that is another another kind of way of losing a lot of your freedom, mm -hmm. as you just sort of mentioned. Mm -hmm. Sure. I mean, more and more we see the, the music industry going to this place where it's very, very curated, you know, uh, live sessions aren't really live no more. And uh, especially in Asia, I got to learn that, you know, there's this idea of perfection, you know, where when you you're when you're out there as an artist, you're not an artist, you're a celebrity, you know, and I'm not knocking that side of the industry. I mean, to each their own, you know, if that's, that's if that's the stuff that uh, makes you feel fulfilled by all means. Uh, but for me, I have always appreciate the beauty and the raw, you know, that that mistake, that ugly noise you made in a song might be the best part of a song. So I, I think that we just have to be true to whatever our spirit is naturally. And if you go against that, you're going to be a very grumpy person. <laughs> Absolutely. I was going to ask you, how has living in all those various countries influenced your music? Because I can see it reflects in your sound. Well, gosh, well, Jamaica definitely going to reflect in the sound because Jamaica is just infectious, you know, like the, the vibe. I remember sometime like people were, were criticizing Snoop for going to Jamaica and being Snoop Lion. I'm like, I don't blame you, Snoop. I know, like when the vibe hits you, it just hits you and you feel good and you're just feeling nice <laughs> with it, you know? So I just think Jamaica was a huge impact on me because I went from Hollywood and then when I moved there, I worked in a ghetto uh, called Tree Mile, uh, Cockburn Pen. And you know, you go from a place where it's really about glitz and glamour and stylists and all of these things to working with kids that, you know, don't have a PlayStation and don't have. And when you don't have much, you just have your body to dance and your voice to sing. You get really good at those things because that's what you got. Yes. <laughs> you yes. know, and I felt so inspired inspired by the kids that I worked with and I, I got to reconnect with myself and sing from a real place and really believe in my own voice again. And I would say before Jamaica, I never sang. I, I was an MC through and through. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I was like, I don't sing like Aretha and, you know, like I, I'm shy to sing and that type of thing. And one day I met this Rasta with a, he was wearing a cooking pot on his head, you know? like proper cooking <laughs> pot. And I was like, and he was singing at the top of his lungs and the man could not hold a note to save his life. It was awful. His singing was awful. And so I walk up to him, I'm like, yo Rasta, why are you singing so loud and why are you wearing a cooking pot? And he's like, you see this cooking pot? Chinese girl, this cooking pot, I'm my style this. No one have this cooking pot style. And you hear my voice? You think it's nasty, but I'm my voice this. Nobody sound like me. So from that moment, I was just like, you know what, let me figure out what I got and, you know, like make the best of it and enjoy the uniqueness of my own voice. And really, that's not to say like sing in a bad way, you know, like, <laughs> oh, no, <laughs> you know? but you can really 
uh, hone in on your skills and work on your skills and work on what you got and really uh, shine for your own unique voice. So I think Jamaica taught me so many valuable lessons that was like that. It is a remarkable place because like I, I think that and I've been talking about this before, but uh, a lot of the people and I'm, I, I have never visited Jamaica, but a lot of the people don't really realize that it's not a very big place because it's such a cultural giant. It's like such a giant when it comes to culture that it's actually like something that you probably like you drive through the country in, a, in, in not that long yeah, time compared to a lot of the other. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's, it, it, it's yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's really it's really like i i really feel like we oftentimes forget the the significance we kind of like we know we know the 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 the, the reggae and the dance hall and we know that it is like the influence on hip hop but then like like yeah but i mean that already covers a lot of stuff for one small nation they do yeah i, I had the opportunity to bring bob marley's granddaughter out to indonesia like some obscure islands in indonesia and when she went out there she saw bob marley you know reggae bar and she's like i can't believe grandfather would be in the middle of the ocean here so far away from jamaica and there's bars dedicated to him so it's pretty remarkable reggae and, and i gotta shout out toronto because everyone mm. from toronto is going to beat me down if I don't shout out the screw face you know I was I was pre-Drake Toronto <laughs> and at the time it was really like the place that grew me in the music it's the place that grew me as an artist that gave me my my uh, confidence and taught me a lot about really what community means in hip-hop and Toronto is like the city you know they don't they don't sugarcoat it they don't tell you you're nice if you're not nice but if you're nice with it then they they give you your daps so Toronto all day every day So now you've been talking like we've been talking about these influences, especially from Jamaica and now Toronto and all that. Now, how about then, like you know, uh, Singapore, Malaysia? Like, like how how is the hip hop over there um, in general? Like, like how how is it doing? Is there a lot of uh, is there is there, is there kind of a distinct feel of like a local feel or influence coming from there and and, and language wise? What what what's the deal there? I think most definitely. I mean, Southeast Asia is such an interesting region because you have all these little these countries right next to each other. You could travel, you know, almost, you know, five countries in Southeast Asia for probably under three hundred dollars, you know. But Singapore is so different from Vietnam, so different from Indonesia, that's so different from Malaysia, you know. Um, so there's all these unique kind of pockets, but for a long time you know for singapore they're a very fashionable cosmopolitan city so they love trendy so anything that's hot in america is going to be hot in singapore so for a long time you see a, an emulation of the american and western sound but little by little you see people begin to really uh, hone in on their own voice and their own culture and be proud of their own languages that's across southeast asia actually so i would say that singapore is the hub the international hub um and it's more trendy it's really more like swaggy like hollywood you know their stylist the, the video quality the quality of all of the everything is looks really really great um vietnam is a really amazing place for hip-hop especially you know you have 89 percent of the population is under the age of 35 so you have this army of young people that are just discovering hip-hop discovering dub music discovering any any subgenre of a subgenre right now and they have the energy to build it and create their own and you know vietnamese hip-hop is blowing up like you would not believe right now uh, indonesia is the same thing huge huge populations i think in jakarta which is just one city there's over 3,000 reggae bands so you can imagine like hip-hop is going to be even crazier um and and malaysia malaysia reminds me of Toronto in the early 2000s where there's just this so much creativity so so much ability and we're waiting for the platforms that are available to showcase these artists to grow as fa fast as the artists are growing so I think it's a very exciting time for Southeast Asian hip-hop um, I think this sense of community um, and as a way to build up education hip-hop as arts education hip-hop as a way to bringing together community is a very powerful thing in this part of the world so yeah it's, a, it's an exciting time for hip-hop out here 
Yes, yes. I think over the years with PEPR, we've realized how big a footprint hip hop has. It's all over. And um, it's been great to learn about every single country that we've ever covered. I wanted to ask you about issues of representation, diversity and inclusion. As a woman, I know we talked about how one doesn't want to be referred to as a female Asian MC first. But but as a female Asian MC, do you feel that you have a responsibility to represent a your country or even indeed your gender? I think, you know, it's been on my mind a lot with regards, not necessarily gender, but just like the feminine energy yes. in, in hip hop, right? So for, for so long, it's kind of like this yang energy was like, yo, my mic, watch me rip your, you know, rip the, with my skills and that, that kind of really like heavy energy. Um, and realizing that, you know, you can have a peaceful power too. A and there's a way feminine. to create music yes. that also exudes that peaceful power. And what does that sound like? Um, and I think that that's definitely in an imbalance. And in this part of the world, especially with hip hop being uh, newer, I guess, than, than the West, uh, those concepts and certain topics are still seen as very taboo. Um, I'm about to drop a track called Vulva Vocabulary, where I'm like, guys rap yeah. about their dicks all the time. Let's drop <laughs> some time. science about the vulva. <laughs> It's time. <laughs> it's time. Let me posterize about the vulva. So um, I was told by the media out here that, you know, that's very obscene. And I was like, well, you know, there's not really any swear words in the song. And that is the name of the part. <laughs> yeah, yeah that, that is the scientific name, you know. But I realized that it's these conversations aren't really normalized. Um, and I was having a conversation with my auntie about this. She's like, oh, that's very rude. Like, don't you feel the shame? And I was like, well, you know mm. what? Like, hip hop has always been something that pushes those boundaries, that shares those messages. And um, having seen, you know, uh, in 2019, there was a sexual assault on a tour that I was on. And when I look at the further impact of things, like if I'm going to make a silly song called Volvo Vocabulary, but that teaches a bunch of young girls that it's okay to name that part and to speak about it, then if something negative happens to them to the extreme of, you know, harassment or assault, then maybe they would feel more comfortable to name and speak about it, you know? So I think everything kind of is related. And look, my audience is straight up 89% male. Like on all yes. my social media is like the boys, you know, and sometimes I'm like, ladies, queens, what's up, man? <laughs> like I'm speaking for you out here. <laughs> but maybe my role as an artist is really to speak that feminine perspective to these guys that are down with me and they are cool to listen to what I have to say. And maybe little by little, I'm changing perspectives in that respect. So I've, I try to like kind of sit back and try to understand the bigger picture of everything. I do think it's very important for female representation. Um, just, just so that different perspectives are shown, just we have a different way of making music. The vocals are different, even speaking to different engineers that like, you know, mixing down female vocals and mastering female vocals is different from male vocals, live sound. The girl on the mic is going to have a different you know, tweak than then all the dudes that are rapping on the mic too. So really um, being able to voice what I need as an artist, because uh, for many, many years, it was just like, all right, I mean, since I'm the only chick on the mic, like, all right, let me just grab and yell a little bit louder since this mic isn't mixed down for me, you know? Um, and so now being able to be more uh, able to voice what I need, I think, and hopefully inspiring others, not just females, but others to voice what they need um, from that space. And uh, yeah, I represent Singapore. My first my first record had the brand, which is like the logo or the iconic figure of Singapore, which is like half lion, half fish. <laughs> mm -hmm. I had uh, the mer lion as a Louis Vuitton print style print on my first cover, but I really knew nothing about my country at the time. I just knew that somewhere in me, I was born in Singapore. So I wanted to represent that as my first record out there. And even bigger than that, I want to represent Southeast Asia because I think it's, it's just um, such a beautiful time for hip hop out here. And 
my record label is called Nusantara because New, Nusantara was the original name for when Southeast Asia was ruled under one sultan. So Malaysia, Singapore, Indonesia, everyone was kind of one and making people realize like even though we have all these divisions at some point in history, we were kind of one. So I, I called the record label Nusantara Records because I wanted to show that and also help showcase Southeast Asian artists to the world. So definitely representing this region as well I wanted to ask you, you you were talking now of course about being a woman in in hip-hop and then before earlier just uh, you know connecting the dots you were talking about how there was a, a proposal for you to be the Asian Nicki Minaj or if I, if I correct this is something wrong. do you feel like I mean of course you got like the hip-hop industry and then you got the hip-hop culture kind of slightly different things but of course many things are a mixture of two of both of these things But uh, it seems to me that the industry is a very unimaginative when it comes to women, and and it this is it, like to me when you when I hear you saying that I'm kind of like yeah that is probably what they would think because that's kind of like the only kind of like a lane that they can give like like and and there's a time and place for everything. I don't I'm not like I'm not like you know people must do whatever they must do. People must listen to whatever they want to listen to. But it's this kind of one track mind of like hypersexualization by whoever and 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 that. Do you feel do you feel like um Do you feel like the cultural side of it is more open-minded, or or or, or, or indeed, is there like a, like if you if you make that conscious decision that now you're gonna do your thing, you're gonna make your music, and you're not gonna do that thing that they want you to do? What kind of is there obstacles on the, are there obstacles in a way, or how how does it work out? Oh yeah, I mean, great question, and definitely I've been criticized. Like, what? You didn't take that deal? Are you crazy? Um, but you know, endlessly when I was working in, in in the West, I'd always get the konnichiwas, the like hey, ching chang chang, and all these like kind of racist remarks. And I'd be like, I speak English, fool. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the first the first language of Singapore is English, uh, so everyone in Singapore speaks English actually. Um, and I definitely you know got pigeonholed a lot of like yellow fever and fetishism and all of that kind of thing and I always told myself you know the way to combat that is just to be really really good you know I a lot of times I'm just really quiet and when I step on stage and when I grab that mic I'll look at that fool that was just talking to me and I'll rip that mic looking right at that person <laughs> little trifling But it feels good. <laughs> um, so I think that, you know, I, I definitely made a conscious decision not to kind of go into that space. And we're definitely in an industry now where it's really an industry of convenience, right? Like I look at you, I figured out what you are. Let's put you on that playlist and boom, we can, if you do all the cliches, actually you probably will have more followers and more likes and more of everything if you fit my expectation of what you are. I think that, I mean, that's a very Yang way, I guess, because it's like, yeah, go, 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 success over everything. But I think there still is a way to maintain your um, individuality and the vision that you have for yourself. But I think it's a lot of a slower path. It's the independence path. It's a very consistent path. It's probably more because you're swimming more against the current. Um, and it takes a while to change people's minds of what they think and assume to wait a minute. Maybe that person isn't quite like that. So uh, it's definitely a slower push, but it's a very satisfying push at the same time. You know, when when I do get to have those open conversations with someone that was like, yo, Meja, I thought you were this before, but actually you, you cool. You cool, man. You cool. <laughs> <laughs> and so I think that I'm looking at longevity Um, I'm looking at being able to affect uh, people positively uh, rather than the convenient way. Um, and yeah, I mean, you know, when I when I was first starting out in Canada, there was no one with my face. I, you know, I was before Honey Cocaine and Aquafina and all of these things when I was on the come up. And I rap in like schools in out back northern Ontario and the only Asian kid in the school would come running up to me and be like, I get beat up at school like every day and you just made it cool to be Asian. Thank you so much. And there'd be like tears running down their face. I'm like, dang, you know, like I never, I never even thought of it that way. Um, and when I started, trust me, I got a hell a lot of hate mail like a lot of hate mail like asian chicks shouldn't be rapping asian chicks are car models or i even got like you trying to bite missy elliott by being all asian and shit i was like wait what like i'm trying to be i am like i am who i am 
how does that even work? <laughs> it's like I'm trying to think. <laughs> Or like you know every, but it worked to my advantage because every time I stepped up for a battle, I already could predict what they were gonna diss me on. They're gonna diss yes. me about being a female. Like you was on my nuts last night, Ray, Ray, Ray. So I could actually prepare really easily for yes. for battles. A really common one was like, "Oh, you're on your Bruce Lee shit." I'm like, "Is that really a diss to be on my Bruce Lee shit?" Like you know, <laughs> like he's kind of he's kind of the man. So like yeah. whatever. <laughs> So, but you, I could always predict what people would battle me on because they were so predictable. Yes. So yeah, you could just rip on them. <laughs> yes. Now, when I'm trying to imagine you or any woman, young woman, entering that stage or that space which is male dominated and people are quite vocal about their opinions, I imagine that one would have to develop like a thick skin. Did you feel vulnerable initially, and did you develop a thick skin? Hmm. You know, I don't. I don't know. It's it's a good question. I mean, it it always hurts, right? Like no matter what anyone says, it hurts to like take the time to read something and be like, she sucks, <laughs> you know. And you're like, I worked a year on that, like ah, and I bared my soul and my most intimate writing and it's just like she sucks um but i realized that you know um when i first started in the industry i would actually respond to comments and be like yo tell me how i could do better if you think that i suck and a lot of the times it'd be like honestly i never even listened to your song i just saw someone else wrote it and i just wrote it to be funny and now that i checked you out you're kind of cool so <laughs> <laughs> so i started to learn that people just like say stuff on the internet without even meaning what they're saying so not to take things so personally um and at the end of the day like i knew the only person i gotta face up to is myself you know so even with that you know you be the chinese Nicki minaj thing like if if i had a kid and they're like mommy i found this video of you like crawling across a car and that wasn't something i wanted to be seen as or i didn't feel that represented me then that's something that i can't do because it just doesn't represent me um and i think that's that's what it comes down to i don't know if i have a thick skin because i've cried <laughs> i felt the pain <laughs> and you know you just you just keep going you just keep going because like you love hip-hop too much you love this music shit too much um I don't know, like, and, and you know what? You probably write a song about that pain to keep going, <laughs> so that, that's okay too. Yeah, um, yeah. yeah, I think, I mean, that's that's the best way. And also, you know, I graduated in architecture and told my Singaporean Chinese parents that I'm going to be a rapper. Man. So if anyone know no Asian parents, that's not an easy thing to do. <laughs> And that will grow you a thick skin real quick because they're like, all right, you want to do that? We ain't supporting nothing. You go do that yes. on your own. And when this fad is over, you come back to us. And I bug my mom all the time, like, 15 years still going. This, this is a long fad. <laughs> My, the, my, I, my, my, so far, so far, my favorite take-home messages from these uh, conversations are uh, that uh, one, number one, representation matters, and then another thing that you would just say that internet is just a place where people say stuff. I think that's yeah. a perf that's a perfect uh, you know if you have to ex explain internet it's just a place where people say stuff it doesn't even matter those keyboard warriors it, it, you yes, know it's like people get real big and brave <laughs> uh, I'll give you yes. another one when I got to work with Dr. Dre like you know I told my mom and we were sitting around uh, at a at a dinner with all my aunties and they're like I heard you work for a doctor now <laughs> <laughs> Not that kind of doctor yo. in a way yes <laughs> but they were mad proud of me because it was the doctor <laughs> like, I'm proud of you too. thank you yeah. <laughs> For different reasons, but I mean, yes. you know, like yeah. it would have to be quite a high, high, high uh, level uh, doctor of, of, a, of a yeah, yeah, <laughs> medical field before it would kind of like compete with uh, with this one. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> And as, a, as as your message, I noticed that freedom, bravery, and being unapologetic were like part of like the the running theme. Is that true? Um, what is your message? I think like I really, really want to make music that makes people feel brave, you know, um, coming back to Asia, I'm realizing how much um, a struggle with confidence, with self-confidence and knowing yourself can affect so many parts of your life. And, uh, 
You know, sometimes when I grab a mic and I'll, someone in the audience will be like, yo, I wish I could be like you. Like, wow, you know, I was like, you are like me. Like I was a painter hiding in my room and like writing my little nerdy raps and hiding them under my bed. Like, oh my God, you know, <laughs> and, and shaking the first time I grabbed the mic and uh, hip hop gave me that freedom, you know, like that I could step into the, on the stage and step into a character called Major One. And when I was Major One, I'm going to be unapologetic. I'm going to speak from my heart. I'm going to be brave and I'm going to, you know, try to inspire others to be brave and to speak their truth. So maybe it's because I was influenced first and foremost by Fight the Power and, the, and my <laughs> early influences were like, just do the damn thing, just do it. Um, or, you know, maybe it's because I'm five foot one and I've been underestimated a lot of my li life, whether it's because of my gender, my race, my position in life. Um, and I was still able to do crazy things that I never imagined and realized my dreams and uh, work with artists that were just my heroes for a very long time. So all of these things taught me that, hey, it pays off to be brave. It pays off to be really true to your own voice. Um, and yeah, there's not much I regret in life, you know? I just really, really learn mistakes and I'm willing to get up from my mistakes. Um, and so, yeah, I think that is my, my message. One, to make music to inspire people to feel brave. And there's not really a genre because I really love a lot of music. You know, I came up in the game around punk music. I do reggae. I've played with an Afro beats band. I've, you know, done so many different things. And uh, really, if there's a genre, it's just freedom music. Do yes. do what you need to and speak what you feel. And essentially, that's what hip hop has always been to me. Yeah. That's very beautiful. I, I thought that is very interesting and, and quite funny when you were talking about like the bravery and, and that's something that you do. And there's the, and, and 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 we were talking uh, talking the other other uh, day with with Kamau from Brazil, who I know you know because we Yay. were part of the same panel discussion one time. But uh, but and he was he was explaining that every like there was like all the different elements and all this. Uh, And, and there was kind of like, uh, whether it was about the equipment or whatever, but then she's like, so I just started rapping because it was like the, the easiest thing to do. And I thought to myself, is it that, to me, that's like the most difficult, that's like, that's like a mountain to climb. It's like, like it's, it's such a, it takes so much courage to just sort of like start basically reciting poetry rhythmically, you know, in front of people it's 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 like a lot but but i mean i really that that's i think that's one of the reasons why i really admire the artists and mcs also i mean other elements as well but they are mcs because it's like it takes a courage it takes courage to because and also hip-hop is so different because there's so many more words uh, it's more so, so much more lyrical than a lot of the other musical styles that one song might have like a two a force of, of 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 lyrics whereas as, as as another song might have just like a you know <laughs> so much to memorize yeah yeah but it's 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 really it's, it's an it's an there's an act of courage there in the mix right yes yeah that that's true you know um when i was making my decision like to do this full time and just to go for it i'm like okay There are a lot of Asian architects in the world, but at the time there weren't a lot of Asian female MCs. So I'm like, let me just fill in that spot again, representation. Let me fill in where, you know, and hey, respect the architects anyways. Yes. <laughs> so I got that degree for the parents, like, look, I'm smart. Tell auntie that I'm smart. <laughs> and now, you know, I've, I feel like I've done my duty up to that level. And now I have to explore and find my own way and, and, and forge my own way. So yeah, I did it as an independent artist. You're daily, you're building a whole different type of foundations than than the architects, right? <laughs> True, because building community, um, building businesses, building up other artists and other creatives is definitely a way to build. And when I came into having to throw my own events, I really had a strong opinion about how to build up the space and what people should experience when they come into a space. So yeah, definitely everything is connected. Yes. 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 Uh, what, what is what is the next thing? What do you, what what are you what are you busy with? Your next offering. <laughs> There's so much. Yeah. Um, let's see. Okay. Well, I've I've put together actually for April, um, which is Sexual Assault Awareness Month, and hopefully going to work with Rain out of America. Uh, I put together a remix to a song I put out called "Not All That Glitters Is Gold," and it's got MCs and singers and. 15 women from all around the world on this track. And I thought that was a really special thing because when we first started with this song, you know, speaking out about sexual assault is very taboo 
and stigmatized in Southeast Asia, you know, like, it's not nice to talk about, like, don't say these things. And, and so I was able to garner this collaboration from artists all around the world to say, no, it's okay. We have something to say about it. They're speaking on it in their own language. They're rapping in their own language. They're singing in their own language. And they're speaking about the situation in their communities. And I was very amazed and, and felt very blessed to have this support from all these phenomenal female MCs from around the world. So that's coming out in April. Uh, as I mentioned, I got Volvo vocabulary dropping for <laughs> International Women's Day, March 8th. So, you know, grab your mm if you love mm mm. <laughs> so that's going to come out. <laughs> and then um, I'm working on my own full length record called Fly Phoenix that I hope to come out by the end of the year. And especially coming out of this time, I'm writing songs that imagine and think about what do you sing about and what do you have to hear when you hit rock bottom and mm -hmm. what's going to allow you to get back up because a lot of people tell me like you're like a cockroach no matter what you just get up <laughs> and i'm like is this a diss no actually like, i'll just yeah. take it as a compliment you know because <laughs> a cockroach is the only thing that's going to survive a nuclear holocaust <laughs> it's resilient this is very cool. resilient <laughs> yeah. which is a more beautiful word than cockroach absolutely <laughs> <laughs> it's a lot, lot better word for it, yeah. But I really wanted to explore this. So many people are hitting, you know, what is their rock bottom and feeling like, what's the point and how do we keep going? And, you know, what what is it? What keeps that tiny little spark to go back into a flame? And that's kind of what I want to explore with the full record, the new record. So that's what I've been working on. And the final thing is... I'm always interested in hustle and music uh, business. And recently I've been feeling a bit jaded that the mus the model of the music industry as it is right now is not fair to the creators. So I've been really working a lot of learning in the Web3 space, uh, working with a lot of NFT creators, working in that metaverse space of, you know, with programs like Emanate that pay pay artists for every single stream and you're getting paid in crypto and at some point i was like what's this mumbo jumbo like you know magic money like no way <laughs> and when the pandemic hit i put freedom fades out as an nft and i sold three and now those three have like are worth like 10 times their original amount and i was like yo this stuff's legit like i, I can't believe this is actually going somewhere and so if it worked for me, anything that works for me, I try to multiply, understand that, that system and multiply it for the creatives that are on my label and that are around me so that we can like pass that knowledge on. So I've been really working a lot in that space. Just dropped an NFT collection called the Yin Yang Club, exploring, uh, you know, whether Eastern philosophy and feng shui and the elements mm -hmm. can actually exist in a digital space and matching it up with music, hip hop, reggae, and, and beyond. And so I've really been working in this space a lot recently. Wow. wow. You gotta innovate, you know? <laughs> you can't let the blood get stuck. Innovate and circulate. You are, you, you, I'm feeling a little bit exhausted. You are so busy, like you're I doing know. so much. And I'm like, I hey, what, what, what am I doing again? Like what's, what's, <laughs> need to step up the game a little Man. bit. Man. <laughs> yeah, sometimes you gotta empty the cup to fill it back up, you know? So it's mm -hmm. okay. Mm. Thank you so much, Asia. Yeah. Yes. Okay. I think this is this is really great. It's so it's 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 an it's, an, it's been very enlightening to talk talk with you and 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 really enjoy hearing your 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 thoughts and, and ideas and experiences because they're very valid. Representation matters. That that is mm. that, that's a big one. That's mm. a big one. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I think we, you know, we want to look at media, we see the inspirational memes and, you know, sometimes you take it for granted. But when you really step into that space and realize that when you occupy that space and speak and speak with power and speak because, you you know, your voice deserves to be here, then you really start to realize how much that representation matters. It so definitely. And for me. That's what hip hop has always been. It's given me a passport around the world. It's given me a voice to be like, hey, I'm not going to be apologetic about who I am. And, and I think that that is hip hop, you know, that we're here and we're speaking and we're bold and we're doing it. <laughs> yes, <laughs> absolutely. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. Thank you so and much. All the it. best. All the best with all your endeavors. There's so much that's on your plate. May it <laughs> just, just unfold with, with ease and grace. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. okay. Bye. Bye.